literature is pretty clear that dairy in general, and this is not even high quality raw dairy, this is dairy across the board, is a beneficial thing for humans. On this week's podcast, I wanted to talk about dairy. It's a contentious topic. Those of you who love dairy, really love your dairy. I have grown to love dairy, but I was not a believer for a long time. And so it was fun to do the research to think about nutrients in dairy, unique nutrients in dairy, why you wanna get a source of calcium in your diet. I talk about other sources of calcium that you might include in your diet. I help you troubleshoot issues. If you're having issues with dairy, I talk about raw versus pasteurized, different sources of dairy. I talk about A1 versus A2 dairy. And I talk about pasteurization, problems with that, benefits of raw milk in the human diet, and the benefits of colostrum in the human diet, these sort of first immunoglobulin rich milk from cows, humans, goats, whatever. But I think that if you have questions about dairy, hopefully I will answer many of them in this podcast. I do talk about the unique nutrients and I talk about the research supporting the benefits of dairy in the human diet. So obviously make your own decisions, be curious, do your own research. But if you're drinking a plant-based milk, real dairy from animals is so much better for you in your life. Uh, enjoy the podcast. Dairy. This is an interesting topic of discussion. For a long time in my diet, I had cut dairy out, thinking that it was a trigger for my eczema. And over the last few years, I've been able to reincorporate dairy, raw dairy specifically, and I'll talk about that in this podcast. And that has provided many enjoyable experiences for me. It's a nutrient-rich food. It complements many foods that I'm eating. It allows for a better calcium phosphorus balance. I'll talk about that in this podcast as well. And so I wanted to do a full podcast on dairy. Now I'm talking about things like milk, yogurt, kefir. Some people say kefir, um, cheeses, which can be raw or not. These products from a variety of animals, cows, goats, some people have buffalo, dairy, even camels I've seen. I'm trying to think if there are any other animals that I've had dairy from perhaps sheep's milk uh, in cheeses. Um, these are an interesting source of nutrition for humans. Are they good for us or are they problematic for us? So I'm gonna talk about that in this podcast and I'm gonna give you the too long, didn't read summary version in this podcast. I'm gonna make a case for the inclusion of dairy of some form or another in your podcast. And in this podcast, I'm going to try to provide tools for those of you who have had issues with dairy in the past. I think there's a pretty clear path of troubleshooting issues that you may have had with dairy. And we'll go through that in this podcast and talk about why I think you may be having issues with dairy, what issues I may have been having with dairy in the past, and how to potentially work around those to include this nutrient-rich, delicious, I would say health-promoting food in your diet. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, you may notice that I have a new Harry Potter scar on my forehead. I was surfing yesterday and the fin from my surfboard literally cut my head at my forehead and into my scalp line. I got nine stitches yesterday, but the show must go on. If any of you listened to my podcast from two weeks ago, it will come as no surprise that I've put some grass-fed tallow on the wound in an attempt to get it some natural vitamin D to help with collagen healing. I've also started retaking skin, hair, and nails from Hardened Soil Supplements. I've talked about that supplement in the past. It has some bovine trachea and scapula cartilage in it, which have unique growth factors that have helped with wound healing and were actually studied by a surgeon named John Pruden. I've spoken about that in the past, but that's what I'm doing for my, my Harry Potter scar and nine stitches on my forehead. If you're listening to this, you can imagine it. It's pretty fantastic. I'm sure it will show up in some of my stories and other content on social media in general, because it's going to be a week or two before it heals enough that you guys won't notice it. So that's what's going on here in case you were wondering. So back on the topic of dairy, how long have humans been consuming dairy? A lot of the conversation in this podcast has to do with some of my ideas and talking to other people on the podcast about their ideas around the evolution of human diet and which choices we've made as humans over the last 350, 450,000 years, 2 million years as Homo erectus and Homo habilis, and how that might inform the way that we eat today. Well, dairy is a component of a diet that I've termed an animal-based diet simply for clarity and convenience that is the newest addition to 
our way of eating as humans. I think grains came on the scene probably about the same time as dairy. The difference for me with grains would be that grains are the seeds of plants. And with grains, I'm talking about things like oats or wheat. Um, technically, these are seeds of plants. And even things like beans are seeds of plants, as are nuts and seeds as well. So I've spoken in the past. I won't go into a lot of detail in this podcast about why I'm not a huge fan of seeds. Seeds being grains, nuts, seeds, and beans. The very short version of that explanation is that these are plant babies. These are all plant seeds. If you plant them in the ground, they will grow a new seed. We have different nomenclature for these seeds, which is just botanical idiosyncrasy. We have different nomenclature for these seeds, dividing them into grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, but essentially they're all seeds. As plant babies, they all have significant amounts of defense chemicals. I've spoken a lot about oxalates. I've spoken about things like phytic acid, a large molecule which chelates, bites onto minerals and prevents their absorption in the human body. This is something that's very common. There's actually a very interesting study that I've spoken about in the past with wheat and beans, specifically showing that when you eat wheat and beans, with a source of zinc, in this case, oysters, it's a very interesting study from the 1960s, the absorption of that zinc is significantly lowered and in the case of beans and wheat together, completely abolished. So if you eat a good source of a mineral like zinc, in this case, specifically a divalent cation, which is just a word that means it has a plus two charge, you really won't absorb that much if you're eating it with foods that have phytic acid. Oats are another food that have lots of phytic acid, other minerals that are divalent cations are minerals that are essential for human life. We've talked about zinc, but also consider magnesium, selenium, calcium, et cetera. Anecdotally, I had experience when I was in college at the College of William and Mary many moons ago, and I would eat a lot of oatmeal. It was cheap, it was delicious, and I ate that oatmeal with milk. And I still think that even in spite of all the calcium with that, at that time, pasteurized A1 milk, and I'll explain all those terms in this podcast, I developed recurrent stress fractures as I was trying to become a distance runner. Never fast enough to make the cross country team, especially not at William Mary, but it was an interesting endeavor for me on the side of my academic studies. So I had multiple stress fractures in the years that followed college. And I think it was primarily due to my consumption of lots of oats and the phytic acid in those oats and the inability of my body to absorb the calcium and perhaps other minerals essential for bone growth in the foods I was eating because of the high phytic acid. So that's just a slight digression to say that dairy, about eight to 10,000 years in the human diet, perhaps the same as grains, maybe grains have even been allowed longer. The difference in my opinion is that even though they're both foods that are relatively new in the human diet, there's lots of good evidence that milk doesn't contain these defense chemicals like seeds do. And there are genetic adaptations in the human genome, specifically the lactase persistence gene, which I'll talk about shortly, that suggests that consuming milk was an adaptation that was favored in human health and evolution, which isn't really that surprising. There's a lot of important nutrients in milk that would have made it a very nutritious food throughout our history. If you go to Africa today, there are multiple tribes that have had milk throughout their whole history. The Maasai are perhaps the most famous tribe, combining milk, raw milk, with blood, which is something that I've tried. It's quite delicious and extremely nutritious. The Maasai are famous for having a ligature that they tie around the cow's neck, I believe, not strangling the cow, but creating like a tourniquet effect like you might have in your arm when you're getting blood drawn. The vein pops out, they use a small sharp tipped arrow to make a puncture in the vein and they can drain the blood directly from a cow that's living. Then they put some sort of poultice or uh, collection of herbs and probably mud directly on the cow as it were a, a band-aid from the Maasai. And the cow goes on living and they're able to drink the milk. There's all sorts of stories like this of humans in the last few thousand years drinking the blood of animals and often combining it with the milk if they have developed the skill of being um, dairy farmers or herders in that sense, goats as well. There's another tribe in Kenya, I believe, called the Samburu that do this, but there are many, many people, there are many cultures around the world that have rich traditions of using dairy. Now, historically, this is all raw dairy. And in this podcast, I'll talk about differences between raw and pasteurized dairy. And many of these cows may have been uh, of genetic lineage that was A1 versus A2. These are different types of the casein protein that break down into different types of beta casomorphin, and that I'll get to later in the podcast. But 
suffice it to say that dairy is in many diets around the world today of cultural origin, many indigenous diets. The Hadza, who I visited in Tanzania a few years ago, did not drink dairy. They did not herd any animals, but they had many neighbors who did. And I saw goats and cows that were herded and used for milk, primarily in the Maasai, the Totoga cultures, and others in Tanzania around where the Hadza were living. When presented with a pregnant or nursing animal, the Hadza would not shun the consumption of milk. They just didn't have the milk readily available because of their the way that they were living, which was completely nomadic and purely hunter-gatherer in terms of their lifestyle. So let's think about why you would want to drink milk. What nutrients are in milk and can you get them other places? I mean, why even have this conversation? Because ultimately, most of the conversations that I like to have on this podcast are centered around the importance of nutrients in the human diet and where you get those nutrients. Because I believe that when we think intentionally about the nutrients we're getting in our diets, our overall health improves. And more specifically, I believe that when we think about the nutrients that we're getting in our diets and the anti-nutrients we might be getting in our diets, like phytic acid, which could be preventing the absorption, assimilation, or utilization of those nutrients, our health can really begin to improve. It's kind of a net equation. For instance, people may say almonds are a good source of magnesium, to which I would argue how much of that magnesium are you going to absorb? Very little to none. They might say spinach is a good source of iron. How much of that iron are you going to be able to utilize and absorb? Very little to none because these both of these are divalent cations, these minerals with a plus two charge. That mineral is not very bioavailable in those compounds. In the case of spinach, because of oxalates primarily, which can also chelate, which is just a fancy word for it, bite onto those minerals and prevent their absorption. In the case of almonds and magnesium, phytic acid and other chelating molecules. Almonds are also moderately high in oxalates if you listen to the previous podcast that I've done specifically on that topic. But just looking at something like chronometer, you can put in 500 grams of raw milk, which is 3.5% fat. This is about a whole milk is 3.5% fat. There's no skim milk in this diet. And 500 grams is half a liter. I currently am consuming closer to a liter of raw milk per day, but I just wanted to do a chronometer breakdown of the nutrients in half a liter of milk. Many of you would be familiar with the ounces. Half a liter or 500 grams of milk is just over 16 ounces. So a large glass of milk, raw milk, full fat milk, is what these nutrients show. So you have 336 calories, you have about 17 grams of protein, 30 grams of carbohydrates, and 17 grams of fat. But it gets really interesting when you look at the nutrients. So you can see just up top here that in 16 ounces of milk, you get 52%, half of your daily recommended daily allowance of calcium. You can see here also that 28% of your RDA for vitamin A is found in just one glass, one large glass of raw milk. That's gonna be a mix of beta carotene and retinol palmitate, but I believe the majority of that is the bioavailable form of vitamin A, which is retinol palmitate versus beta carotene. There's 125% of vitamin B12 in raw milk, just one glass. 17% of your RDA for folate, that's a nutrient that's important for methylation, for neural tube formation in the fetus, and important for all humans, but especially for women thinking about conceiving or women who are pregnant. And there's 20% of your RDA for potassium, and this is just in one large glass of raw milk. Breaking it down a little further, you have saturated fats, which are a mixture of things like stearic acid, palmitic acid, fats that are helpful and nourishing for humans. And you actually have 0.6 grams of trans fats. This is something important to consider that not all trans fats are the same. These trans fats are not harmful for humans. The majority of these trans fats are things like conjugated linoleic acid. Sometimes that's a little confusing for people when they hear that term. Conjugated linoleic acid is not the same as linoleic acid. Without going into the details of the structure of those two, just suffice it to say that those are two completely different molecules that do different things in the human body. Linoleic acid has many negative effects in the human body and conjugated linoleic acid appears to have many positive effects in the human body. These are essentially hormones or signaling molecules. And just like one molecule of, that is a hormone such as testosterone and estrogen may only be different by a few atoms the arrangement of double bonds in things like 
conjugated linoleic acid and linoleic acid can impact the structure of those molecules in a great fashion. Milk is also a great source of riboflavin, vitamin B2, another critical nutrient for methylation, for mental health, for energy production. Riboflavin is critical for the production of energy in your cells in a process called the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. One glass, one large glass of raw milk contains 77% of your RDA for riboflavin. At which point I would ask you, where are you getting your riboflavin if you are not drinking raw milk, if you are not eating heart or eating liver? Riboflavin is a really important nutrient. It's a really important B vitamin that is often overlooked. And I think many people are deficient in this nutrient who are not eating animal products. There's really no good way that I've found to get your riboflavin without eating animal products. Liver is perhaps the best source along with heart, which is why I'm such a fan of those two organs and I eat them basically daily, either fresh or desiccated from heart and soil. And milk is a great source of riboflavin as well. I've spoken about this in the past, but I have an MTHFR polymorphism. Without getting too complicated here, I'll just say this is the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. And what we now know is that if you are getting a significant amount of riboflavin in your diet, probably three milligrams per day, even someone like me with a polymorphism in their MTHFR gene, specifically I have a 677C to T polymorphism, which slows down that enzyme's ability to convert one form of folate to a usable form of folate in the human body, that riboflavin can act as an allosteric modulator of MTHFR, specifically in this case, returning MTHFR, that enzyme, to native function. So my MTHFR is slowed, but if I get enough riboflavin, which is more than the RDA for riboflavin, I need about three milligrams a day based on the research perhaps, my MTHFR gene works just like someone who doesn't have a polymorphism, specifically the 677C to T. If that's all confusing, the high level there is that riboflavin is important for things like methylation. Methylation is important for detoxification of compounds in your body that it's trying to get rid of, the excretion of hormones that your body is trying to regulate amounts of. It's important for the formation of many neurotransmitters in your body and many other signaling molecules. So there are hundreds of reactions that involve methylation, the formation of DNA, and riboflavin and folate specifically, along with B12 and B6 as well, are critical components of that set of methylation reactions in the human body. So where are you getting your riboflavin? Well, raw milk is a good source. Again, I'm just making the case for the consumption of milk in the human diet. We talked about vitamin A. There's a small amount of vitamin E, but as you can see here, there's actually a good amount of vitamin B6, another B vitamin known as pyridoxine, that I mentioned as being important in methylation in just one single glass of raw milk. We talked about calcium, 520 milligrams of calcium. There's a moderate amount of magnesium in one glass of raw milk, 50 milligrams of magnesium. People often ask, where do you get magnesium on an animal-based diet? This is something I've spoken about in the past, and the combination in my diet of orange juice, raw milk, Coconut water from coconuts, meat is actually a good source of magnesium, and the fruit or fruit juice that I eat gives me more than enough magnesium. There's really no good RDA for magnesium actually in humans, but most people would say that 400 milligrams is a, an amazing amount of magnesium in your diet, and that's about what I'm getting per day. It's not easy to get 400 milligrams of magnesium from your food, and remember, as I spoke about earlier, magnesium in many plant foods is not going to be as bioavailable as people say it is. So getting your magnesium primarily from animal foods or foods like coconut water or orange juice that aren't going to have things like phytic acid and oxalate that decrease the availability of that magnesium is a good thing. So again, magnesium found in raw milk. Phosphorus is an important nutrient for humans. It's part of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, an energy currency in the human body. It's important to balance calcium and phosphorus. You can see that milk has a little more calcium than phosphorus. I'll talk about the calcium phosphorus balance a little later. There's a moderate amount of potassium, 20% of your RDA in one glass, 11% of selenium, and there's actually a little bit of zinc, 1.7 milligrams, which is 15% of your RDA for zinc. So I've spoken a lot about nutrient powerhouses in the human diet, how to get nutrients into your diet in an easy fashion. 
And it's clear to me that mostly animal foods are in the top 10 here. Liver is probably the most important source. I'm a huge fan of heart, meat in general, but though I haven't talked about it in this podcast, eggs are great as well, but milk is a really good source of nutrients for humans. And again, this is why it's a good thing to have in your diet. I think that many of the nutrients that I just spoke about in milk, you can get them from eating things like heart and liver for sure, but what you can't get from eating other animal foods easily is that calcium. So I think that in some ways, milk is a unique source of calcium. Now, this is also disregarding the other things that are found in milk that I'll talk about in this podcast, IGF-1, which is a valuable peptide, a short protein molecule that has all sorts of regenerative and healing and growth promoting, which is a good thing in humans, uh, effects in the human body, that's found in milk as well. And I'll talk about a component of milk, specifically a component of the first milk from humans, goats, sheep, or cows called colostrum later in this podcast that has been found many, many times over to have all sorts of benefits in the human body because of the unique peptides it contains. Things like TGF alpha and beta, also things like colostrin, and again, I'll go into detail more in, later in this podcast, but colostrin has been studied in Alzheimer's disease patients and appeared to improve Alzheimer's disease outcomes in terms of mental capacity in those patients. But milk and its components are clearly valuable in many ways for humans. Going back to the history of milk in the human diet, we can look at historical accounts of milk drinking. There's actually, I believe, Egyptian hieroglyphics that suggest milk consumption. There are all sorts of things inscribed on stone tablets from thousands of years ago, five to 10,000 years ago, showing milk consumption in the human diet. As part of the research for this podcast, I came across this article, which is pretty interesting. The milk of ruminants in ceramic baby bottles from prehistoric child graves. This is published in Nature, very well-respected journal. But it just is interesting to note that in Neolithic Europe, in the Bronze Ages and Iron Ages, this is five to 6,000 years ago, there were clay vessels which were used as baby bottles. They can see the age of these bottles and they see residue from milk in these bottles. So humans have been putting milk in bottles for babies for thousands and thousands of years. That's really interesting. And then if you look at the lactase persistence allele or gene in humans, there's an interesting pattern. So this is an article from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2007. The title is The Absence of the Lactase Persistence Associated Allele in Early Neolithic Europeans. And what the authors of this study were trying to figure out was whether People with lactase persistence genes were selected for in terms of milk consumption or the consumption of milk led to the appearance of the lactase persistence gene in humans. If you read their conclusions, it appears it was probably the second situation that it wasn't that humans who had lactase, the ability to break down lactose, who drank more milk, it probably was that the consumption of milk actually somehow led to people developing this gene in their bodies and selected for the persistence of this gene in humans. This is a very, very conserved allele in humans, meaning that there is very good evidence that the consumption of milk was a positive, selective force in human evolution throughout our history. And as we'll talk about a little later in the podcast, there's also evidence that drinking raw milk can help humans develop the ability to metabolize that milk. Raw milk also contains this enzyme, lactase, again, an enzyme that breaks down lactose, a disaccharide, a two-sugar molecule of galactose and glucose in humans. But as you drink more raw milk, it also appears that your body gets signals from that raw milk somehow, and you may have the ability to break that milk down more easily. So there are multiple disaccharides, just to make this story clear for people. One of those is sucrose, which is glucose and fructose, but another is lactose, which is glucose and galactose. So there is a disaccharide, quote, sugar in milk. Again, I think this is quite beneficial for humans. I don't fear these in the human diet in their whole food. Form. Just wanted to pause the podcast for a moment to talk about our grass-fed colostrum, which is called Immunomilk. We're gonna be just calling it grass-fed colostrum soon at Heart and Soil. Check out this review. 
Uh, Grass-fed colostrum is the truth. While I take many hard and soil supplements, I felt compelled to write a review on this one because it has been extremely effective for me. I took six capsules three times a day after getting a pretty bad bronchitis. Two days later, I was symptom-free. I'm not advocating this as a prescription antibiotic, but it sure fit the bill for me personally. The immunoglobulins and lactoferrin in this product obviously boost the immune system and improve my recovery. Please try this product if you want to boost your body's natural immune defenses. This is the review I'm reading. It is the truth. So as I say at the end of this podcast, colostrum is super beneficial for humans. Our colostrum at Heart and Soil is grass-fed and grass-finished, desiccated always in glass bottles. Check out Immunomilk, soon to be just grass-fed colostrum at heartandsoil.co. I've found it personally to be beneficial with wound healing, athletic recovery, gut stuff, all sorts of things. I think this is one of our most underrated products and certainly will benefit your overall health and quality of life. Check it out, heartandsoil.co. Back to the podcast. So with this history of drinking milk for the last 10,000 years by humans, the clear evidence for the nutritional benefits of milk by humans, why would people not include milk in their diet? The research would support the assertion that milk is a healthy food for humans. There is no association between milk and cancers, and I'll actually show you research to suggest an inverse association between milk and many cancers. And there is no association, and in fact, in many cases, an inverse association between milk and the development of obesity, both in children and adults, and the development of other metabolic issues in humans. So the literature is pretty clear that dairy in general, and this is not even high quality raw dairy, this is dairy across the board, is a beneficial thing for humans. I know many of you may have had personal experiences with dairy, and I'll talk about lactose intolerance, A1 versus A2, raw versus pasteurized later in this podcast, and help you troubleshoot some of that if you haven't been able to include dairy in your life. But I wanted to lead into that with a discussion of the literature and support for the notion that milk is a healthy thing for humans in the diet. This is an interesting study to start with. The title is Dietary Fats, Carbohydrate, and the Progression of Coronary Atherosclerosis in Postmenopausal Women. I say it's interesting because the author is Darius Mazafarian, someone who has spoken about seed oils and claimed that they're beneficial for humans. So some of his research I would agree with and other of his research I would say is a little misguided, but at least in this article, I think they came to reasonable conclusions. And interestingly, in this article, they defend saturated fat in the context of cardiovascular disease, something that I've spoken about many times in the past. So this is observational research, but they did look at the coronary arteries with coronary angiography. This is when you look at the coronaries under an X-ray with a radio-opaque dye injected in them. They had 235 postmenopausal women with coronary artery disease, and they had a mean follow-up of 3.1 years. Their assessment of coronary artery disease progression was with something that's pretty good, actually looking at the inside of the coronary arteries with coronary angiography, again, over 3.1 years in 235 women. And the conclusion is very striking from a lot of reasons, from a dairy perspective and from a saturated fat perspective, because saturated fat in milk is perhaps one of the reasons that milk is vilified, if you believe that saturated fat is bad for humans. But they say in postmenopausal women with relatively low total fat intake, a greater saturated fat intake is associated with less progression of coronary atherosclerosis, whereas carbohydrate intake predominantly, and I'm editorializing here in the form of grains, if you read the study, was associated with a greater progression of coronary atherosclerosis. And if you read the study, what you'll find is that the women who had more dairy, which is a good source of saturated fat, had less progression of cardiovascular disease in their 3.1 year follow-up. So that's interesting because many would make the case that because saturated fat raises your LDL cholesterol, something I've spoken about on previous podcasts, that that is going to lead to an increased progression of cardiovascular disease. But at least in this study, what they found was that the women who are eating more of traditional carbohydrates, grains, rice, oats, wheat, those sorts of things, had increased progression of cardiovascular disease. Again, this is an observational study, so we can't draw causative inference, but 
in this study, it's pretty hard to suggest that saturated fat would in any way, shape, or form worsen, or there's certainly no association with worsening of cardiovascular disease. And yet that is specifically something that is often vilified very strongly in that context. There are many studies which echo these findings, but I will just mention a few others. Here's another study, the relationship between high fat dairy consumption and obesity, cardiovascular and metabolic disease from 2012. Again, this is observational evidence. They looked at multiple studies and they said the observational evidence does not support the hypothesis that dairy fat or high fat dairy foods contribute to obesity or cardiometabolic risk and suggests that high fat dairy consumption within typical dietary patterns is inversely associated with obesity, which means the more high fat dairy, a presumably high calorie food, high in saturated fat, there was a lower risk of obesity. Again, this is observational, but this flies in the face of many of the conventional nutritional ideas. Although not conclusive, these findings may provide rationale for future research into the bioactive properties of dairy fat and the impact of bovine feeding practices on the health effects of dairy fat. So I would argue, as many would in this space, because there's a significant amount of literature here, that dairy fat is very beneficial for humans. Another study looking at milk fat and biomarkers of milk fat. The study title is Biomarkers of Milk Fat and the Risk of Myocardial Infarction. It's a fancy word for heart attack. In men and women, this was a case control study, which is a type of observational study done in Sweden. It's a large population-based cohort in Sweden. It had 444 cases and 556 controls. The conclusions were milk fat biomarkers, specifically things like trans palmitoleic acid and others, were associated with a lower risk of developing your first heart attack, especially in women. This was partly confirmed in the analysis of fermented milk and cheese intake. So in this study, markers suggesting people were consuming more milk fat were associated with less of a risk of heart attack. But how can that be when we're consistently told that saturated fat, just like the kind you find in milk or butter, this is also a metric for butter consumption, is a negative thing for humans? Well, as you all know, if you follow any of my work, I don't believe that's the case at all. Another study, dairy consumption and patterns of mortality. So this is overall death in Australian adults. This is a follow-up of 14.4 years. They looked at 1,529 adult Australians aged 25 to 78. It's observational epidemiology. Overall intake of dairy products was not associated with mortality. A possible beneficial, we keep seeing that, association between intake of full-fat dairy and cardiovascular mortality needs further assessment and confirmation. So if you're looking to make the case that saturated fat from dairy or butter, which is obviously dairy, is leading to heart attacks, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary and even evidence to suggest that this is protective for humans. So earlier in this podcast, I asked this question, why would we want to consume dairy? Well, at least from this significant amount of observational literature, I don't think a lot of interventional studies have actually been done here other than natural experiments, looking at the health of people like the Maasai in Africa or indigenous people who consume dairy and they tend to be extremely lean and quite healthy, just look at photos of them. But in this case, it's another argument that the consumption of dairy appears to be beneficial from a metabolic health perspective, from an obesity perspective, from a cardiovascular disease perspective, perhaps because of the nutrients in dairy, perhaps because of a satiety effect promoted by the unique fats in dairy, the stearic acid, the saturated fats, transpalmitoleic acid, who knows, or perhaps the peptides in dairy, IGF-1, but there does appear to be a signal for a beneficial effect of dairy in the human diet. Here's another study looking at transpalmitoleic acid, a marker for dairy intake, metabolic risk factors, new onset diabetes in adults. Interestingly, this is also from Darius Mazafarian, and the conclusions were essentially the same. Circulating transpalmitoleate is associated with lower insulin resistance, presence of atherogenic dyslipidemia, which was lower, lower incident diabetes. So 
at least in these observational studies, and again, this really hasn't been studied in an interventional fashion in humans, it looks to be quite beneficial for humans, unique nutrients in these things that are beneficial for humans. With regard to cancer, you can look at articles like this, Dairy Products and Cancer, an article from the Journal of the American College of Nutrition. And just in the abstract, you can see that the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research Report concluded there was a probable association between milk intake and a lower risk of colorectal cancer and limited evidence of an association between milk intake and a lower risk of bladder cancer. There was a question of a signal regarding prostate cancer. That's probably a whole separate podcast. When you actually really look at the evidence, there's not a strong association between dairy consumption and prostate cancer either in humans. They say since the 2007 report, several additional large cohort studies have been published, including two that show an inverse association between the intake of cultured dairy products and bladder cancer. So dairy and cancer doesn't appear to be an issue for humans either. And there are many summary papers like this one, Milk and Dairy Products, Good or Bad for Human Health, an assessment of the totality of the scientific evidence. Totality of the scientific evidence supports that intake of milk and dairy products contribute to meat nutritional recommendations, may protect against the most prevalent chronic diseases, whereas very few adverse effects have been reported. Specifically, they talk about reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, particularly stroke. Furthermore, beneficial effect of milk and dairy intake on bone mineral density, no association risk with bone cancer, milk and dairy intake inversely associated with colorectal bladder, gastric cancer, and breast cancer. Gastric cancer is cancer of the stomach, not associated with the risk of pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer. While the evidence for prostate cancer risk was inconsistent, as I mentioned, that's a whole sort of thing to dive into, but when you really look at it, I'm not concerned about dairy and prostate at all. There's no association between milk and dairy products and increased all-cause mortality. And as the authors point out, cow's milk is vastly superior to plant-based milks. Perhaps I should have mentioned that in the beginning of the podcast. If you are drinking almond milk or oat milk, why are you doing that? Um, milk is much more nutritionally healthy and those milks are made from seeds and will have many of the same problems that those seeds have. Phytic acid, oxalates, digestive enzyme inhibitors. In fact, I've spoken in the past about a case series in pediatric patients, so children suggesting that the consumption of almond milk was associated with kidney stones, painful urination, and recurrent bladder infections, and the removal of almond milk products improved those conditions, probably all related to some sort of oxalate deposition in those kids. Now, if we then look at the totality of evidence, it appears that milk is quite healthy for humans, and I don't see a lot of evidence to the contrary. Some people might argue that IGF-1 would go up if you're drinking milk, but as I mentioned earlier, IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1 is a very beneficial thing for humans. I have a significant amount of dairy in my diet, and if you've seen my podcast where I detail my IGF-1 levels, where I talk about my blood work, I've done this many times in the past, you'll know that my IGF-1 is not elevated. In fact, it's probably right about the average or even below average for Americans. So I think that IGF-1 concerns in milk are overblown and we must not forget the beneficial effects of IGF-1 in humans. This is a little bit similar to the mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin conversation that I've had in the past. The short version of that conversation is that both mTOR and IGF-1, which are connected in many ways in humans, are beneficial growth signals. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be vital and virile and fertile, and strong and resilient to injury throughout your life. You want mTOR, you want IGF-1. These are not problematic for humans. It's how you lead a healthy life in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s, where you outperform your peers and you are more resilient than they are. Injury is a very common cause of death, morbidity and mortality as we age. We know that the loss of muscle mass is very clearly tied to early death in humans. How do you retain muscle mass? You get lots of protein, which will trigger mTOR in a healthy way. Drinking dairy will also give you bioavailable protein and IGF-1. Again, you want to maintain that muscle. Maintaining muscle as you age both makes you look good, feel good, perform better, 
And why do you look good? Because there is something in our brains that makes us understand that that woman or that man is strong and resilient. And that is a good set of genetics. And you can enhance that set of genetics with the foods you eat. So let's move on to the question or some details of dairy. If you're going to include dairy in your diet, which type of dairy should you include? So off the bat, I would say, I think that there is a lot of interesting evidence for raw milk and cheeses made with raw dairy or kefir, fermented products made from raw milk. So the conversations will be around raw versus pasteurized. Then I will talk about A1 versus A2. And then I'll talk a little about different types of milk from different animals. But let's start with the raw conversation. Raw milk was something that I never had growing up. I had homogenized pasteurized milk. But in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years of my life, raw milk has come across my radar. It's been an interesting thing to experiment with. So specifically, what really drew my attention to the benefits of raw versus pasteurized dairy was a significant amount of research looking at benefits in children. And what we find is that kids who grow up drinking raw milk versus pasteurized milk have less allergic conditions as they age. Specifically, they have less hay fever, less seasonal allergies, less asthma, and less eczema. These are all conditions that are considered atopic conditions. This hits home with me because I had eczema and asthma growing up and I didn't have raw milk. Specifically, there are studies like this one called the Gabriella study, which corroborate these assertions. The title of the study is The Protective Effect of Farm Milk Consumption on Childhood Asthma and Atopy, the Gabriella study. And they show that boiled farm milk did not show a protective effect. And the findings suggest that the protective effects of raw milk consumption on asthma might be associated with the whey protein fraction of milk. So interestingly, in this study, in the Gabriella study, they were asking the question, what is it about the milk that is protective? And when you think about this intuitively, the first thing that I thought of and that many people think of is that there's some sort of bacterial probiotic effect from raw milk, quote unquote. But in multiple studies now, it appears that this benefit of raw milk is actually a protein in the milk, a whey protein, which has beneficial effects in humans when it is not denatured through cooking. So what does it mean for it to be raw? Raw means the milk is not heated. It's not pasteurized. Pasteurization can be many different temperatures for many different amounts of time. But generally, if whey protein is heated above 160 degrees Fahrenheit, it changes conformation and the protective effect appears to be lost. Now, does this mean that as a kid, I had eczema and asthma because I was drinking pasteurized milk? Or could it have been that I didn't have a protective effect from raw milk? Certainly, there were many other components of my diet as a child that could have triggered my asthma and eczema, grains, low-quality foods, etc. So it's hard to tease all of that out. But heating your milk will potentially lose many of its beneficial effects. Again, there's lots of evidence that drinking raw milk as a child, whether you grow up on or off a farm, because that's an interesting potential confounder, is beneficial from an asthma, allergy, eczema, et cetera, perspective. So my sister has a son and a daughter, and I'm excited to see that they're buying and drinking raw milk in Virginia in hopes that this will set those kids up. They don't live on a farm. They live in the suburbs of Northern Virginia, and I hope the kids will be set up with better immunology, lower risk of those atopic things as they age. Also, the kids are fed an animal-based diet the majority of the time. It's not perfect, but my sister does a great job with what she's feeding the kids. And so it's interesting to see them growing up and being pretty healthy for kids. I may be biased because they're super cute and they're my niece and nephew. One more paper looking at raw milk, inverse association of farm milk consumption with asthma and allergy in rural and suburban populations across Europe. They came to the same conclusions, and it's important to note, as I mentioned earlier, that this was not limited to children who grew up on farms, because you could imagine that growing up on a farm will change your gut microbiome, your entire body's microbiome. Sure, I think it's great for kids to be outside in nature, but I also think that based on the studies, you don't have to be in nature to get the benefits of raw milk, or that could have potentially been a confounding thing in these studies, suggesting that, well, the raw milk may not have been the benefit. Maybe it was the fact that kids were growing up on the farms, but when you see kids in suburban areas drinking raw milk and finding benefit, it's probably not the growing up on the farms that's really causing the um, benefits there. Now, why does raw milk get a bad rap? I think historically, this has a little bit to do with the history of milk consumption in the United States. So prior to late 1800s, early 1900s, there was no such thing as pasteurization. But pasteurization connected with Louis Pasteur 
probably did affect milk positively in the early 1900s because of how low quality the milk became at that point in time. Like so many things throughout our history as humans, as we've industrialized, the quality has gone down. And probably for thousands of years as humans, raw milk was not a problematic thing for us. Yes, there are bacteria in raw milk, but there are both good and bad bacteria. And generally the quote, good bacteria balance out the problems of bad bacteria. Also the quality of the food the cow gets, the living conditions for the cow and how the cow is fed can affect the quality of the milk from the cow. We know that feeding a cow lots of grains creates inflammation in the cow's gut. This is something called subacute ruminal acidosis, something I've spoken about in the past. Perhaps this happens in humans as well, but getting milk from a cow that is fed predominantly grains may make that cow less likely to produce good milk or more correctly or clearly stated, may make that cow more likely to produce milk that has potentially pathogenic things in it. If the cow is not as healthy, milk may not be as pure or as healthy. So in the late 1800s, a lot of cows and dairy farms were fed on swill. What is swill? <laughs> the origins of that word are that it is from the grain production of alcohol. It's the remnants, the dregs of alcohol production. So it's grain, water, um, the used up grains from the production of alcohol, pretty low quality foods. And there were problems with contamination of milk in less than sanitary conditions at the turn of the century, this being the um, 20th century, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And in that case, the pasteurization of the milk did appear to have some net benefits from a, an overall uh, public health perspective because the milk was such low quality to begin with. But in 2023, personally, I believe that if I'm getting my milk from farms and I get cow's milk and goat's milk, but predominantly goat's milk these days. But if I'm getting my milk from farms that I trust that are feeding the cows and goats well, uh, I don't really worry about contamination in raw milk. And my anecdote alone, for what it's worth, is that I've never had a problem with raw milk. I've never gotten sick from raw milk, raw cheese, or raw butter. And I think it's because of the quality of the milk. Now, certainly if you are immunocompromised, if you're worried about this, um, then take this into consideration with raw milk. There's always a chance of contamination when you're eating raw food products, whether it's raw meat, which I wouldn't recommend, raw vegetables, <laughs> raw fruit. I mean, people get sick from eating raw fruit. Um, unless you're cooking everything in your diet, which we know may have uh, negative effects, especially when it comes to things like fruit or uh, milk specifically, there's really always a chance of those issues. And there's also a chance with raw organs, I should mention. I've not had an issue with raw organs um, in my life. I've really not gotten sick from raw organs, but know the quality of the organs you're eating. And I think this is also an argument for desiccated organ supplements like we make at Hardened Soil. If you freeze dry the supplements, it's a very low temperature dehydration process. It's actually below freezing to preserve as many of the nutrients as possible, and all the supplements are tested. So it's a completely safe way to get organs if that's a concern for you. So organs or milk in this case, make your own choices, but I've never had a problem. And I think there are lots of good farms to get raw milk. And I talked about why you might want to get raw milk or raw dairy in your diet. If you don't want to drink raw milk or you can't find raw milk near you, most grocery stores have raw cheese and it'll say on the label, the milk is raw. I believe they must say that the milk is raw on the cheese. Usually it will be advertised as such. If it doesn't say that, or it says pasteurized, then you're using a milk then you're eating a cheese made from a pasteurized, a heated milk, which is probably going to have a whey protein conformation, which may not be as protective for humans as we talked about. Where do you find raw milk? You can use the website realmilk.com. I have no association with them, but I think it's a great index. I believe it might be run by the Weston A. Price Foundation. And many states do have legal ways to obtain raw milk. Again, I think it's a very valuable, delicious, good part of the human diet, as I mentioned earlier. What if you are lactose intolerant? Again, raw milk actually contains lactase and the consumption of raw milk does appear to promote the formation of the lactase enzyme in humans. Maybe start with small amounts of milk. I've found that goat's milk is more digestible than cow's milk and goat's milk contains about 25%, give or take less lactose than cow's milk. So if you're sensitive to lactose, maybe start with goat's milk if it's raw and go from there. So. I think a lot of people drink milk and they get stomach ache, and this is could be lactose intolerance. That's probably going to be worse with pasteurized 
homogenized milk. Homogenization is when all the milk is mixed together so the cream doesn't separate to the top. So if you're getting a raw milk, there's gonna be cream on top, which is delicious. Eat that with honey or just mix it back into the milk and you'll have something that's amazing and basically food of the gods. Uh, it's biblical even, you know, land of milk and honey. How do you get better than that? So if you have lactose intolerance, consider raw milk, consider small amounts as your body's adjusting. There are lactase pills. You can take a lactase enzyme. Many of those pills are probably made with excipients or things that bind the pills together that are not great, silicon dioxide, things like this, but it is a way to have raw milk and a lactase enzyme while your body's adjusting to that perhaps. Now, there's another thing that I think can be problematic for humans with milk that isn't talked about a lot, which is A1 versus A2. This is the isoform of a casein protein in milk. And I much prefer A2 milk. How do you know if it's A2? Well, if you're in the United States and you're drinking cow's milk, it'll either say it's A2 or it'll say it's from Jersey cows. Jersey cows are generally A2 cows. They make a type of milk with a different type of casein in the milk. Anything from goat, sheep, buffalo, camel, it's all A2 milk. So the only thing you have to worry about for A1 milk, which I think is more problematic for humans, and I'll show some research in a moment, is a cow that doesn't say A2 on the label or that's not a Jersey cow. So consider that as well. If you're sensitive to milk, consider an A2 milk. So I think the best thing for a human would be a raw A2 milk. And if you can't get raw milk, an A2 milk that is low temperature pasteurized might be the next best thing. If you can get goat or sheep or buffalo or camel milk and it's raw, then you're also getting a raw A2 milk. Why do I think A2 is a, an issue for humans? Well, there's a lot of literature about what happens to casein, a protein in milk, when it breaks down. Here's an article, Milk Intolerance, Beta Casein, and Lactose. And the articles talk about the fact that at least in rodents, A1 beta casein, this is the breakdown product of casein from A1 milk, increase the gastrointestinal transit time. The production of DPP-4 and the inflammatory marker myeloperoxidase compared with milk containing A2 beta casein. So there is a potential hypothesis here that A1 milk is just not as good for humans. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that that might be the case. Here's another article comparing the gastrointestinal effects of A1 versus A2 beta casein. The summary here is that um, A2 does appear to be more gentle in the human gut and A1 appears to be perhaps more inflammatory in certain models, animal models and humans. So perhaps A1 milk is not that great for humans. There's lots of other potentially problematic connections here. An article, type one diabetes and cow's milk based on casein variant consumption. The authors of this article suggest that beta caseomorphine 7, which is the breakdown product of casein from A1 milk, has opioid properties which include immunosuppression, could account for the specificity of the relation between the consumption of some but not all beta casein variants and diabetes incidence. What they're basically saying here is that it appears in some research findings that consumption of A1 casein is more associated with type 1 diabetes. And I've always kind of wondered about type 1 diabetes. What is going on with this autoimmune condition where the pancreas gets inflamed in children? Could it be an A1 variant of casein from A1 milk that is promoting this. Again, here's another argument to not feed your kids A1 milk and perhaps not drink it yourself. There's even research like this to suggest that A1 beta casein could be connected with overall mortality or ischemic heart disease and other illnesses. So in this study, which is observational, they show a correlation between the consumption of the milk protein beta casein A1. I believe this is from the um, WHO Monica project. They also look at regional differences, France versus Northern Ireland. They say people from Northern Ireland are estimated to consume 3.23 times more beta casein A1, excluding cheese than the French. There's an agreement between the mortality and the consumption of this allele, suggesting it's a factor worthy of serious consideration and potential source of cardiovascular disease when taken in conjunction with regional variations in traditional risk factors. They say beta casein A1 consumption correlates strongly with type 1 diabetes incidence in zero to 14 year olds suggesting that ischemic heart disease and diabetes share at least one causative risk factor. So it's interesting because much of the other research that I presented earlier in this podcast didn't show much association between milk consumption and uh, any diseases, but when it's actually broken down A1 versus A2, 
a signal starts to emerge. And I think that the concern here is just that if you have any issues with milk consumption or you want to feed it to your kids, I think it makes more sense to do A2 milk. And there is a significant amount of evidence to suggest it might be more beneficial. I talked about different types of milk. I just wanted to share this article about camel milk and its unique antidiarrheal properties. Again, camel milk is A2 milk. I've actually had camel's milk in the past and it's quite good. If you can get it, uh, I would try it in yourself and your kids. There is some uh, connection with uh, potentially benefiting children with autistic traits in camel milk, perhaps Crohn's disease. I think there's a lot of connections here between many of these even neuropsychiatric illnesses and milk consumption possibly related to um, different variants of milk and even casein. Here's an article looking at autism and schizophrenia, perhaps related neuropsychiatric illnesses and intestinal disorders. And in this article, they do talk about this possible connection between a gluten casein free diet and improvement in autistic children and definitely improvements in schizophrenia as well. And it's the question here is, is this related to A1 uh, casein in many of these milks that most people are drinking in general? So again, just some curiosities here overall. But in summary, I think there's enough evidence to suggest that A2 dairy, this being Jersey cow, it will be labeled as A2 generally. Manufacturers are catching on to this. And goat, camel, bison, sheep, these are all A2 milks. That's better for humans in general. Now, I perhaps should have talked about this at the beginning of the podcast as a reason to drink milk, especially with calcium, but just wanted to give a mention to the importance of balancing calcium and phosphorus in the human diet. Diets rich in meat are quite high in phosphorus. Phosphorus is a beneficial thing for humans, but if you're only eating meat and not eating a source of calcium from dairy or cheese, there are other sources of calcium. Perhaps the best might be something like uh, ground up bones, at Heart and Soil, we have a bone matrix supplement, which is microcrystalline hydroxyapatite. If you definitely didn't want to do dairy, you might do a microcrystalline hydroxyapatite from a grass-fed cow, like eating a bone. I think bones are beneficial for humans. They have unique growth factors in them as well. Um, too much bone calcium can lead to constipation. Too much of these uh, calcium sources like eggshells, which are decent, can lead to constipation if you do too much. But eggshells are another source of calcium that humans may benefit from if you're absolutely not going to do dairy. As I mentioned earlier, I think dairy is the best source of this, but balancing calcium with phosphorus appears to be beneficial for humans. There is research to suggest, it's mostly observational, that elevated amounts of phosphorus in the human diet don't have great outcomes in humans. So also consider on the flip side of that, that calcium is essential for many of the reactions in the Krebs cycle, a biochemical pathway at the center of our energy regulation in humans specifically enzymes pyruvate dehydrogenase, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and isocitrate dehydrogenase are calcium-dependent enzymes. So yes, your bones are a reservoir for calcium, but all of us lose calcium every day. So if you are not taking in any calcium and you are losing calcium every day, this is going to create a negative flux of calcium out of your body. Meat has a small amount of calcium, but certainly nothing close to the RDA, which is 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams for humans. Getting some milk, cheese, again, eggshells, bone uh, matrix, just the actual microcrystalline hydroxyapatite of bone may help with this, but getting calcium in your diet, I think is very beneficial for humans, probably from an energetic perspective. And there's research to suggest that calcium consumption is protective from a gastrointestinal health perspective as well. So get calcium, don't overeat phosphorus without balancing your calcium. If you are a strict carnivore and just eating meat, hopefully you're getting some organs in your diet, but think about getting a calcium source as well. Most of you will know that I've spoken in the past about the benefits of carbohydrates in the human diet. That's a separate podcast as well. So think about the calcium phosphorus balance. As we wrap up this podcast on dairy, I also wanted to talk about colostrum, which is a really powerful component of dairy. It's the first milk from animals, whether it's goat or cow or humans. Any of you who have had a baby know that it's pretty valuable to breastfeed the baby from the beginning. And the first milk you produce is colostrum. The conversation around cows is often the same as milk. If we use the colostrum of a cow, the first milk of a cow, and we're eating it as humans, and I'll show you lots of studies that suggest significant benefits of that, is there enough for the calves? And yes, one of the interesting things about 
most humans or many humans and cows or goats is that they overproduce these things. We, you know, the females of these species tend to make lots of milk and lots of colostrum, perhaps an indication to how important these are. So when you're eating raw milk from cows, the calves are not starving. And if you're eating the colostrum, there's always enough given to the calves of the cows to make sure that they're able to be healthy uh, animals and the extra is used to benefit humans. So here's a good review article on colostrum and its benefits. Um, as they say here, it's a nutrient-rich fluid produced by female animals immediately after giving birth. It's loaded with immune and growth tissue repair factors, significant quantities of complement components, which are proteins in the immune response. They have natural antimicrobial agents to actively stimulate the maturation of an infant's immune system. So bovine colostrum, so cow colostrum, uh, can be used to treat or prevent infections of the gastrointestinal tract. It's used that way many times in sort of the holistic health space. Many of these complement components or immunoglobulins in colostrum may bind harmful proteins in the gut, and certainly taking colostrum has benefited many people um, at an anecdotal level. There's also evidence to suggest that it's beneficial from a GI perspective. They also note that it has remarkable musculoskeletal repair and growth capabilities, Studies have shown that colostrum is the only natural source of two major growth factors, namely TGF alpha and beta and IGF one and two. I mentioned that a little earlier. Those growth factors have significant benefits in terms of muscle and cartilage repair. They promote wound healing and they have practical applications for trauma and surgical patients. And the colostrum growth factors have multiple regenerative effects that extend to all structural body cells, such as the gut. So I'm reading from the end of the abstract there. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going to be taking colostrum again to heal this Harry Potter scar on my swollen head. Hopefully not too distracting for those of you watching. There's actually a very interesting set of research regarding the use of colostrum, bovine colostrum, and comparing it to vaccination for influenza in healthy, high-risk cardiovascular studies. Specifically, the study is called um, the San Valentino study. It's an epidemiology study. For those of you watching on YouTube, I'm showing the actual study. And so this is a two-month treatment with oral colostrum for the prevention of flu episodes. It's compared with an anti-influenza vaccination. The groups included healthy subjects without prophylaxis and those receiving both vaccination and colostrum. They followed up after three months and the number of days with flu was three times higher in the non-colostrum subjects. So that's pretty interesting. In part two of the study, they had a similar protocol with 65 very high-risk cardiovascular patients, all of whom had prophylaxis. Presumably this is the uh, flu vaccination. The incidence of complications of hospital admission higher in the group that received only a vaccination compared with the colostrum group. So there were two arms to the study. So in the first arm, it was people who had either vaccination or vaccination and colostrum. And the people who had vaccination and colostrum did significantly better than vaccination alone. In the second arm of the study, they had high-risk cardiovascular subjects and they looked at admission to the hospital. Those who got vaccination and colostrum did much better than vaccination alone. So none of these trials were colostrum versus vaccination, but they added the colostrum to the vaccination and they saw significant improvements and found it to be very cost-effective. I think it would be interesting to compare colostrum versus vaccination head to head, but I think probably from uh, an IRB, an institutional review board, that may have been a tricky thing. Here's another study, the prevention of flu episodes with colostrum and bifivir, which is a probiotic supplement, compared with vaccination. This is an epidemiologic registry study. In this study, there were multiple arms, no prevention, vaccination, vaccination plus immunomodulators. Immunomodulators were a combination of bifivir, which is a probiotic supplement, and colostrum, and immunomodulators only. So there was a group in this trial that was only colostrum plus bifivir. They say the number of episodes registered with the immunomodulators was significantly lower than in those observed in patients using vaccination or no prevention. <laughs> the number of days of disease was higher in untreated controls compared to the groups treated with immunomodulators and two times higher in the vaccination group compared to the same groups. The average relative costs were significantly lower, 2.3 times in the immunomodulator groups in comparison with the other groups. 
So in this study, they did something that was a little bit, uh, a little bit aggressive, and they actually had an immunomodulators group which performed very well, even compared to those without flu vaccination. Vaccinations are a hot button lightning rod topic. So when it comes to flu vaccination or any other vaccination, talk to your doctor, but there actually is research out there suggesting that colostrum can be beneficial for these flu episodes in addition to, or even standalone um, when you're thinking about viral infections. I found that to be very interesting. There are literally hundreds, perhaps thousands of studies looking at the benefits of colostrum in humans. Uh, just one more. This is colostrum a proline-rich peptide complex isolated from ovine colostrum, so that's sheep colostrum, for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. This is a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. They looked at 46 Alzheimer's disease patients divided into three groups, randomly assigned to receive either colostrum at 100 micrograms per day, a bioorganic selenium at 100 micrograms per day, or placebo tablets. The cycles lasted three weeks. Each patient received 10 cycles of treatment during the year. Outcomes were assessed by psychiatrists blinded to the treatment. So eight of the 15 Alzheimer's disease patients treated with colostrum improved. And in the other seven, the disease stabilized. In contrast, I'm reading from the abstract, none of the 31 patients from the selenium or placebo groups with similar mild or moderate Alzheimer's disease improved. The administration of selenium uh, led to stabilization in 13 of the 15 patients, whereas in the placebo group, only eight of the 16 patients were stabilized at the 12-month trial and evaluation. Colostrum was found to be remarkably safe, and the results, they say, were very encouraging and deserve further research. So there is actually pretty striking research suggesting that colostrum and the peptides it contains can even have a beneficial effect when it comes to neurodegeneration. And why are we not surprised? I mean, TGF alpha and beta, IGF one and two, these are beneficial peptides along with colostrum and another peptide in colostrum. These are involved in regeneration and healing in humans, not things to be feared. I'll also mention that at Hardened Soil, we have all of our supplements tested for informed sports certification, which is a third party testing for contaminants, these sorts of things. And all of our supplements pass except two. Uh, one of them is colostrum because Informed Sports will not certify colostrum because colostrum is actually banned in the NCAA because of the potentially beneficial effects of IGF-1. And now, when you run colostrum through the Informed Sports or the third-party lab testing, nothing comes up as a flag, but uh, Informed Sports will not certify colostrum because it is NCAA on the banned list because of the benefits of IGF-1. So those of us who don't play NCAA sports can benefit from colostrum in our diets. The other supplement, as I've mentioned in the past, that did not pass informed sports testing was whole package because of the presence of naturally occurring testosterone and other androgens in bull testicles. That's a subject for a different day. I've talked about it on social media. Who knows? Maybe bull testicles will be banned from uh, professional sports in the future, but whole package and colostrum did not pass informed sports. But those of us who are not competing professionally or being drug tested can benefit from both of those supplements. At Hardened Soil, we do make a grass-fed colostrum supplement, which will have many of the benefits that I talked about here. Colostrum is sometimes very hard to find fresh. If you can find it from a farmer that does raw milk, great, do that. But if you can't, even small amounts of colostrum, like that found in uh, the, our grass-fed colostrum at Hardened Soil, would be beneficial for humans. But however you get it, including some colostrum in your diet, may be really good, uh, along with raw dairy in general. I want to just circle back to one thing as I wrap up the podcast. For those who are lactose intolerant, using fermented dairy can be helpful because the fermentation process breaks down the lactose. Kefir or cheeses will have much less lactose and yogurt will have less lactose than a full fat regular dairy that is not fermented. Now, I also want to mention the difference between kefir and yogurt. Yogurt is heated usually to around 140 degrees and has a certain set of strains in it of bacteria. Kefir usually has more diverse flora in it and is fermented for a longer amount of time at room temperature. So I prefer kefir to yogurt. And if people are not careful about the way they're making yogurt, you can heat the yogurt too much and end up with a pasteurized, essentially dairy product for what it's worth. So if you're going to do fermented dairy products, I prefer kefir because of the different 
an increased number of strains to make kefir, bacterial and actually eukaryotic strains to make kefir, and the longer room temperature fermentation process versus a shorter, higher temperature process with yogurt. If you like yogurt and you have a good source for it, preferably a source from raw milk, a lot of yogurt is made from pasteurized milk, remember, then that can be a healthy part of the human diet as well. So in summary, we went through a long journey around dairy today. I talked about the history, how long it's been in the human diet. I talked about all of the benefits of dairy, both from allergic, atopic, asthma, eczema perspectives. I talked about differences between raw and pasteurized milk, ways to get around lactose intolerance, the difference between A1 and A2 milk, why you might want to lean toward an A2 milk, different types of milk, goat, buffalo, camel, sheep, A2 cow's milk from Jersey cows. I talked about the benefits of colostrum, immune benefits, potentially neurodegenerative benefits, potentially healing and athletic recovery benefits, certainly gut benefits. Colostrum is a very beneficial thing to have in your diet along with dairy. It's a type of dairy. I talked about the fermentation, lactose, kefir, yogurt, cheese, those sorts of things. And I talked about the calcium and phosphorus balance. But I think that the medical literature certainly supports the notion that dairy is beneficial for humans. Don't fear it. And I think that once you are able to troubleshoot, hopefully this podcast helps you kind of walk through that pathway. If you are not doing well with milk, first find raw, find A2 raw. If you're lactose intolerant, opt for kefir, a low temperature yogurt, or a raw cheese and then opt for goat in A2, sheep's milk, camel's milk, et cetera, or A2 cows. And I think if you go through that process, many of you will find you'll be able to reincorporate dairy into your diet successfully. And I think that will improve your health long-term in many ways, both subjectively and um, in terms of your longevity, perhaps, and your strength and your recovery. And I think that that will help balance your calcium and your phosphorus and all sorts of good things. And if you are drinking a plant milk, because you want to have a milk in your diet, removing that plant milk and going to a actual source of dairy will be a massive improvement in your overall health. Again, dairy is so much better from a nutrient perspective. I talked about the specific nutrients that are found in dairy, none of which are found in plant-based dairy. And if they are, they're going to be added in synthetic forms, which are not as bioavailable, potentially harmful in some cases. Many non-dairy milks, quote unquote, many plant milks have gums like carrageenan, which can be harmful to the gut. Many of them contain seed oils. And even if it's just oats and water or almonds and water, I talked about the problems with seeds, anti-nutrients, phytic acid, et cetera, there. So hopefully this podcast has been helpful, guys, regarding dairy. Let me know in the comments what you think. And I'm going to go drink a glass of raw goat's milk with the best honey in the world in Costa Rica. I will see you guys soon.